Welcome everyone to our um, February ethics lecture. We're so glad that you are joining us today. I am Robin Axel Adams. I'm the manager of the Fairbanks Center for Medical Ethics. Just one quick reminder before we jump into our lecture today that um, our ethics conference, our biennial ethics conference is on February 12th. Uh, registration for that ends this Friday. And so please, if you'd like to attend that, please visit our website, which is fairbankscenter.org and you can get registered for that. Um, but a registration does end Friday, so we hope you'll join us. Just a few preliminaries. Um, we just appreciate your understanding if we have any technical glitches um, in the midst of the, a virtual webinar. You will receive a link for your evaluation for CE and CME tomorrow at the email address that you used when you registered for this webinar. You must complete the evaluation to receive credit. This month, the evaluations are going to close on Tuesday, March 2nd. So please fill out the evaluation though, even if you don't need credit because this helps us track um, our virtual attendance and provide feedback to our speakers. And this webinar is being recorded and will be available on our website, fairbankcenter.org within the next week. And the recordings are eligible for CE and CME. So please feel free to pass those along um, to your colleagues. The Q&A box is gonna be located um, on, in your screen and um, that's where you can post questions, but we will not be responding to them most of them until the end of the presentation when Dr. Gilbert is ready. And Dr. Gilbert finally has no financial conflicts of interest to disclose. Whew, preliminaries out of the way, let me introduce Dr. Gilbert to you. Dr. Gil Ann Gilbert has been a psychiatrist in the Indianapolis area for 35 years. Two years ago, she left the patient, the practice of inpatient emergency and consultation psychiatry to start at IU Health, a behavioral health telemedicine hub launching in 15 emergency departments and rural consultation into rural inpatient hospitals in 2019. This year, there are plans to add three additional emergency rooms outside of the IU health systems, emergency consultation for EMT services and integration into the 90 primary care offices that IU health has to provide further behavioral health expertise to all through telemedicine consultation. Anne and her colleagues have done over 6,000 consultations and their volume has tripled since the pandemic started. Dr. Gilbert is a friend of the center and I always learn so much from her when I hear her talk. In the last year, I'm sure that everyone who is on this lecture today um, has experienced telemedicine in some way. So I know that today we will be challenged and enlightened by what Dr. Gilbert shares with us. So Dr. Gilbert, thank you for being with us today. Thank you. Um, let me see if I can do this now. Okay, can everyone see this? Yes, you are still, okay. um, you're not in gotcha. mode yet. Okay. There you go. There we go. All right. And let me get the little controls. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so just a little bit of a background. Um, I started into um, telemedicine before it was, um, before we all rushed to it. Um, I had all sorts of questions at the time from my previous partners, like, um, how do you, how can you do that? Isn't it different? Um, do you enjoy it? And I really was most concerned with um, uh, being able to spread um, psychiatric um, uh, knowledge. Sorry, my screen jumped up with that Zoom thing and I'm trying to get rid of it. Okay. Um, spreading um, psychiatric care um, to our outlying um, areas and, and really wasn't expecting to um, enjoy the telemedicine uh, part of it all, but um, it was great. I used to tell my partners, I said, oh, it's just like being in those emergency rooms. Um, you know, people are, you know, vomiting or, um, <laughs> or restless or, um, you know, screaming. You just really can't um, smell it is the only difference. Um, and there are some other differences, uh, which we'll go through also. So first, you know, nothing's complete without a few definitions. Um, first, telehealth is a general um, term that includes telecommunication technologies uh, to support clinical health care, education, or even public health. And I think um, any of us who have gotten the vaccine and get the uh, regular telehealth communications about whether we're having side effects to the vaccine, um, that is a form of telehealth also. 
Um, so telehealth includes video conferencing, uh, which is a real time, um, like Facebook, FaceTime, stuff like that. It also includes the email, texting. Um, we have things such as Twizzle, um, which we can send screens to patients and get information back. It includes monitoring equipment like uh, telemetry, um, phone calls, um, and even faxes to patients. Um, so it includes both the synchronous management of patients um, and the asynchronous management of patients. Um, it also includes whether you are um, giving consultation to another provider, um, curbside consults, uh, maybe um, telephonically. Um, it uh, includes review of records, a review of x-rays. Um, it includes any education or distance learning. Um, any home monitoring, any public health investigations, um, health data management, i.e. Um, our medical records system, especially now that they're all um, virtual and they're all online. And um, also integration of healthcare systems like the CareWeb um, system that we use and other hospitals around the state use. Now, telemedicine, uh, tends to be more narrowly defined, and it, it's really the scope of direct clinical services, including any preventative care, diagnostic care, treatment delivery, um, and it can be both synchronous and asynchronous. So then uh, just a few more terminologies. There's mHealth, uh, which is really exploding. Um, and it's the use of any mobile technologies, um, such as your smartphone, your iWatches, your Fitbits, uh, to organize and deliver input from wearable or remote monitoring systems. And typical examples of this are uh, continuous glucose monitoring systems. So now you don't actually have to um, send in your blood sugars to people. You can continuously monitor it and see it on your um, iPhone or your iWatch. Um, telemetry, um, blood pressure, heart rate monitoring. We have mobile oximetry units. So in our hospital at home, um, where uh, we sent home COVID patients, um, we enrolled them in a hospital at home program. And in that program, we would send them with mobile oximetry units. And um, I've, uh, I haven't been as involved with that, but um, you know, at one point in time, um, one of the nurses monitoring our hospital at home program uh, noted one of um, the patients at home that their um, oxygen level had dropped and so made a quick phone call to that patient, woke them up and said, take some deep breaths, let's see what you're doing with your oximetry. Um, his um, oxygen level went back up to normal. Um, he eventually fell asleep again. It continued at normal, but they were able to maintain him at home, but could have called in a minute's notice to uh, get things going for him. Uh, symptom trackers, um, eye therapy apps, um, which um, our own um, uh, Silver Cloud is a evidence-based therapy app that they made available to our own team members during this time um, for stress and depression. Um, there is a new whole um, level of mobile that's called eye therapeutic gaming. Um, an example of this would be a game called Super Better, in which a woman who had had um, a uh, programmer uh, had had a brain injury and developed quite a bit of depression from it. And so she eventually developed a game that she could play. She was a, um, actually a game developer that she could play that would actually start treating her depression. And she labeled it as super better. There's a uh, really exciting work being done for treating um, teenagers with gaming apps too. Um, artificial intelligence, a lot of these um, eye therapy apps um, have put um, some artificial intelligence that makes them a little bit more user friendly and less rote. Um, there's approximately a half million M Health apps available um, on the Apple Store or on um, um, the other um, applications. So synchronous uh, telemedicine is a live, real-time, two-way video and audio connection. So in theory, it's a, about like being in the same room with a patient and they interact directly. This is would be your FaceTiming or your Zooms. 
Um, it closely resembles an in-person interaction, although it lacks a few um, things. Then there is asynchronous telemedicine, which is um, a digital recording of patient data. A typical example of this would be reading x-rays um, after the fact. X-rays would be sent to an off-site um, radiologist that would read and then send back information. Another application for this is uh, teledermatology um, and then subspecialist consults um, also can be used with that. So um, this is how fast we've adopted this in, um, I'm trying to, yeah, let's move that out of my way. Okay, um, we have really rushed to telemedicine. It was very slow to adopt. In 2019, when I took this job, um, you know, I thought that IU Health was so far behind the times um, and um, Ian McDonald, who's the um, director of um, virtual care at IU, said, actually, everyone talks a lot about it, but no one is really doing any more than IU Health was doing at the time. So in 2019, before COVID, a third of inpatient hospitals and then less than half of outpatient facilities had any kind of telehealth services for their patients. Um, since then, you know, since COVID and we um, wanted to keep patients safe and providers safe, now about 75% of US hospitals are using telehealth and telemedicine system. Um, and the number of patients that have used telehealth in 2019, it was just 11% and it's now um, 76% in 2020. Um, in 2020, uh, about half the physicians had used telehealth for the very first time. Um, now, 90% in 2020 have physicians have treated patients remotely. 68% um, of physicians believe it will have a lasting impact on the patients they see. And I'd be surprised if this is not a little higher. Um, and 77% of physicians support the shift towards telehealth. So I was on a general telehealth meeting um, in which there were several different specialties of telehealth. Um, and one of the doctors made the comment, I hope this doesn't go away um, when COVID goes away because I could see it really helping burnout also. So for example, they had rearranged their, I think this was a uh, OBGYN, they had rearranged their practice um, so that they did at least um, one day or two half days of telemedicine. Um, and they said during those days, you know, the lack of the commute, um, the ability to um, sign on and off quickly uh, really reduced a lot of their burnout also. And then a fifth of physicians expect to use it um, as uh, more than they did pre-COVID. Um, so the real adoption I think has been made with especially chronic illnesses. You know, people with chronic illnesses spend a lot of time um, monitoring, going to the doctor, going to the, di uh, you know, going to see the dietician, um, um, having their blood pressure taken, and it's been a real boon to them. 77% of people with chronic illnesses say they, they definitely plan to use it more. Um, uh, especially in rural areas um, that do not have access to specialists, um, they are really seeing um, additional um, uh, utilization for it. Um, currently, IU Health has a, um, ho um, a night hospitalist that goes uh, telemedicine-wise to um, nurse practitioners in our rural hospitals um, for um, higher level uh, treatment if needed. Um, and the, the real interesting thing about the adoption though, is we really thought this was going to be for the rural community that didn't have access um, to these specialized services. What's actually happened is, is the urban community that has embraced it more. Um, they tend to be more tech savvy anyway, and they don't wanna drive to Eagle Highlands for their appointment and get a babysitter. They wanna do it right there, so. Um, the other interesting thing about it is that um, we can definitely do telemedicine with smartphones. And um, the smartphone use in Black, White, and Hispanic households is about equivalent as to it is in um, higher uh, economic um, income. So we're able to actually um, reach um, people with um, 
uh, a lot of barriers to care, or transportation barriers to care, because almost everyone has um, a, a smartphone. So actually, it is um, being a boon for um, access for previous populations that were um, had a harder time um, with follow up. So. Um, this is a hot off the presses, January 2021. Um, and this is, I think, very uh, telling and interesting and also endorsing um, to traditional medicine. What it turns out is that, you know, there's been a 43% increase um, in telehealth um, to um, if you have any chronic prior physical condition. For any behavioral health conditions, there's a 53% increase. Um, and for any condition, it's about a 51, for a new condition, it's about 51%. But these blue lines are, I'm seeing my existing provider. The orange um, tips of these are seeing a new provider. So essentially people still want to see their provider. They're not you know, dialing up a, a provider in Hawaii to talk to them in Indiana. They're actually, you know, wanting to see the same doctor, their regular provider. They just want to do it more telephonically. So this is good news for um, regional-based uh, systems such as ours. Uh, we've also seen just this rapid relaxing of regulations in response to the pandemic. It's called um, um, the public health emergency. So it's in response to um, COVID and the quarantining and um, the pandemic, um, vendors of telemedicine services have had a tremendous um, difficulty keeping up. We have always used um, a preferred provider, Amwell, and that is IU Health's preferred provider. Um, and they've, uh, as soon as the pandemic hit, um, all sorts of their systems crashed because we could not provide um, for all the people that wanted to do telemedicine and consults um, all of a sudden with that provider. So as a result, um, uh, HSS, HHS um, started um, some emergency provisions for this kind of thing uh, during the pandemic. Um, it's called a public health emergency. Um, and it makes, um, it makes it easier for patients to connect with a lot of different systems. And these are, during the public health emergency, which is um, still in effect, it was supposed to um, go out of effect, I think in January, but it's been extended for at least two more months. Um, these are the public health emergency allowed telehealth vendors. Uh, and you can see it's any non-public facing video chat, uh, which includes uh, the above. I know Zoom had some difficulty unless you had the special um, medical Zoom. Um, they've tightened up. Uh, there were some um, security risks um, in some of these, which have now, I believe, all tightened up their security adequately. So these are the IU Health preferred vendors of which American Well, um, they'd like everyone eventually to convert to American Well. Now American Well was difficult to use, although they now have rolled out a product called um, Amwell Now, which is very similar to the easier products to use, such as DoxyMe, which is an extremely easy product to use and most of the physicians were using as opposed to um, Amwell Now, but um, Am or, because Amwell Now didn't exist. Um, so for IU Health, um, they've actually done a, a, a big dive into security. So Amwell, um, WebEx, Microsoft Teams, Diagnotes, which is our secure texting, um, DoxyMe, uh, the paid clinic, clinic membership, Zoom, Google Duo, and Apple FaceTime were all approved. They're trying to move all these people really into Teams and Amwell at this point in time. The other thing, um, uh, there is an expansion of telehealth um, with the 1135 waiver. So originally Medicare would only pay for telehealth um, if it was being furnished in um, 
certain locations and or if the patient were in a certain rural location. Um, since the public health emergency, this um, has been completely loosened. Um, they will pay for doctors, nurse practitioners, psychologists, licensed clinical social workers. Uh, they can all offer uh, telehealth um, to their clients. And um, we can offer it directly to the patient's house and expect uh, Medicare to um, pay for it. Um, this also is included with uh, telephonic. Um, um, so you can do a phone um, consultation with the patient and also during the public health emergency um, have it reimbursed. Almost all major insurers follow Medicare uh, recommendations. So most of the other big insurers, Anthem, Blue Cross, Blue Shield are following the public health emergency for reimbursement also. So getting into some of the ethical concerns in telehealth, and some of these are concerns um, for us anyway, um, but you know, there's uh, certainly nuances. Um, you know, making sure that with telehealth, we have the same quality of care that we do um, without virtual, and we'll get into some of the fine points of availability bias and other issues that can um, complicate our quality of care. Um, consent and autonomy. So we do have to consent patients to participate in a telehealth evaluation. Um, IU Health in their general consent um, in there is written telehealth. So if they go into an IU Health facility um, in the general consent, this is written in. However, if they're in a primary care office and or at their home, you do have to ask them verbal consent at this point in time during the public health emergency is okay, but you have to document that they've given verbal consent. And the other thing that we really struggle with more in telehealth than anything else is privacy. One, um, a private location um, for yourself that um, it, HIPAA still applies to, but also for the patient. And um, it's more difficult when you are on, um, on with a patient in telemedicine to tell if they have privacy or not. So we are frequently asking and also um, telling the patient to tell us if at any point in time their location is not private. Um, there's, you know, access to care and technology issues. Uh, not everyone does have um, adequate broadband to be able to do telehealth. Uh, there's the legal and regulatory issues. Again, during um, the public health emergency, um, there was a pact among several states um, that we would honor telehealth between states. Um, Indiana is in one of those PAC states. I can't tell you how I always have to look up who's on it. Um, but um, previous to that, you had to be actually licensed in the state that you were delivering telehealth to. Um, there's certain provider obligations, which we'll go into a little bit more. There's patient uh, responsibilities and obligations. Um, the doctor-patient relationship can be a little more difficult. It's nice if you have an established relationship already and then you can do telehealth afterwards, um, but um, it, if you're just starting off with telehealth, uh, you have to pay some special attention to that. I, I will tell you that um, the School of Medicine wanted to offer um, um, behavioral health um, uh, treatment to their medical students. And their requirement when they first started, I don't know if it's still this way or not, um, but I had the opportunity to sort of re review what the medical students were saying about this. Um, they liked the ability that they had to be able to connect with a behavioral health therapist. But what they really complained about is that their first um, appointment had to be in person. They thought it should all be, um, be able to be driven by telemedicine. So um, not everyone feels that you had to meet your uh, doctor first, um, but most of the time now, because of the pandemic, we already had a relationship with our doctor uh, before we went to telemedicine. Um, commercialization, there is just a, a huge opportunity uh, to commercialize or advertise through a telemedicine product, but this is illegal. Um, there's certain informational needs and documentation that really don't change whether you're doing it telehealth or whether you are actually um, not in virtual. And there's certainly cybersecurity issues. Um, so 
the documentation is identical uh, in telemedicine to not in telemedicine, and it should and you should keep that in mind. Everything you would document in a patient chart, if you they were in front of you, has to be in the telemedicine visit, including the physical exam that in which you can do. Some of it might be um, from monitoring equipment, some of it might be for observation, and some you can't do in a telemedicine visit. So, in addition to everything else that you would put in a regular um, visit, you also have to, um, if, if it's not in one of our facilities like our ERs or inpatient units, you have to um, document that the patient gave verbal consent. Um, you have to make a statement that the service was uh, provided using a telemedicine modality. My personal uh, statement is um, this consultation obtained through a real-time interactive video conferencing platform so that they know it is a synchronous um, platform. You have to document the um, origin of the patient. Um, for example, Bloomington Emergency Department, the location of the provider, the virtual behavioral health team, um, 714 North Senate Avenue, Indianapolis, Indiana, 46202. Um, you have to um, document the names of the pers uh, persons per uh, participating in the visit. So for example, um, you know, the patient was alone in the room as they were interviewed. Um, they gave me um, permission to um, talk with their mother through collaborating uh, telephone arranged with mother. Mother participated individually from patient. Um, and uh, telemedicine uh, visits need to be documented in a timely fashion. Um, in our clinic, uh, we say no longer than an hour to get the full note in the chart, and most people are getting it in the chart in five minutes. But you can't, uh, depending on your specialty, you can't, um, you know, go more than at least 24 hours without that note being in the chart, just like you would do in a real person visit. So texting also is telemedicine, um, and you should not text any patient identifying information um, on your phone at all. This is illegal, um, unless you have an encrypted text messaging service. That's why IU Health has um, purchased for everyone's use um, the encrypted text messaging platform called Diagnotes. Um, and when you're texting with patients, um, you can only text with related to their treatment or healthcare emergencies. You cannot solicit, um, make appointments, um, or anything along those lines. It's only if um, you're giving treatment recommendations um, or if it's an emergency. And that's all uh, per the Telephone Consumer Protection Act, um, Act. So you won't be getting one of these soliciting uh, messages from your doctor. And if you do, you can report them. So there, there's a little preparation and I'm gonna tell you I'm traveling today. So I'm not in my normal, um, uh, uh, in my normal um, uh, uh, telemedicine uh, place. Normally I actually have an apartment off my house. Um, there's no one there in my background. I have um, a subtle bookcase um, and I have, it's right next to my router. Um, so uh, and I have complete confidentiality. So what we do um, and what everyone should do preparing for the patient's appointment is first review their medical records, just like you would before you go into their room, any test results, um, any communications you've had from the patient or about the patient, um, and then um, make sure that you have everything you need to get informed consent. Um, so if you're doing a telemedicine visit to the patient's home, uh, the office staff uh, should prepare the patient, make sure that their broadband can um, tolerate the technology, instruct them in the technology, how to sign on, what would happen during the visit. Um, patient, um, there's some preparations for the patients too. Um, so they should always be in a private area, free from distractions, um, no children around unless it is um, a children's visit. Um, um, no one that they don't want um, to be in the um, visit with them. Um, and then also, I always like to tell them that if someone does walk into you, which happens frequently in our emergency rooms, um, please tell me if someone comes in the room immediately so that we can make sure your HIPAA is protected, um, which is one of probably our biggest um, uh, biggest obstacles at time is you almost have to read the patient's 
face. Um, maybe they'll stop talking all at once. Um, and uh, all at once, um, I'll say, is there someone else in the room with you? I do encourage them to speak up, though. Just tell me if anyone's in the room with you. Um, interpreters. Uh, so interpreters can be used. Uh, we actually have an interpreting cart called Marty. And um, we call our telemedicine cart in the emergency rooms, we call him Bob because Bob is our IT guy that helps us all the time. So we call him Bob Jr. So we have had the experience of having Marty, Bob Jr., the cart, both carts, um, myself and the patient, all um, talking between the four of us. Um, we've also had the opportunity to use an interpretation line. So um, uh, difficult, but not impossible. Um, you can add, one advantage of telemedicine is you can actually add um, um, other parties onto your consultation if you would like. So for example, especially in geriatric medicine where um, maybe you're talking with the patient themselves, but um, you want their caregiver to be able to get information or to give information, you can add that caregiver onto the same appointment without um, them actually having to physically be there as long as it's okay with the patient. Same with ped uh, pediatrics patients um, or even adolescent patients. Um, make sure, especially with telemedicine, you know, when you're waiting in a doctor's office and they're late, um, they should do this also. Um, it's nice to get an update, usually from the secretary. Oh, he's running or she's running about a half hour behind. We're going to get you in as soon as possible. But don't forget your telemedicine visits. They need to know if there's a delay so they can go on and um, do other things and, and hop back on when they need to. Um, so professionalism is important in telemedicine visits. I think sometimes people get a little lax with this. Um, so you definitely want to set your stage or your exam room. As I talked about, um, I'm actually traveling today. This is not a bad background, um, but you. Um, but I'm fearful that um, my husband who's traveling with me might walk in. I don't want you to think he's ever there during a telemedicine visit. Um, so you want to make sure that you have a place that has privacy, confidentiality, um, and has some professional standards. Um, should be minimal background noise. Um, I know this summer when we all went to telemedicine, for some reason, it seemed like um, the people that were building a pool across the street were driving me crazy. Now, the good thing is a lot of this telemedicine equipment um, actually muffles out that noise. Um, and I would always ask the patient, I said, can, can you hear that in the background? And actually they never could, they could just hear my voice. And the use of earphones also is very helpful in muffling out background noise. Um, you just need a secure phone, computer, camera, other devices that you'd use regularly. Um, I regularly work with at least two screens. I just have one screen here with me today, um, but my iPhone um, serves as a second screen. Um, so it's nice to have, be able to have their chart up um, and them up at the same time, um, as well as being able to um, even chart things in uh, another um, area. Um, make sure that your space is HIPAA compliant. Um, you, you should dress professionally. Um, I usually like to wear something with IU Health emblem. I don't have my name tag on, but um, I do like, uh, we have, you know, have made special uniforms, uh, virtual care, IU Health, so that, you know, that they know you really are who you say you are, which is um, part of our IU Health team. Um, it certainly can be more casual, um, and usually people can only see you from um, about the chest up. Um, so a lot of people in virtual care don't necessarily wear white coats, um, but certainly should be um, formal looking. And then you want to make sure that your camera is positioned correctly. Um, my normal camera um, it is up a little bit uh, so you get a better view. And then when I'm looking at the computer, um, I automatically look at the camera. Um, so today, since I'm traveling, I have it uh, propped up on a, two puzzle boxes to make it a little better, but it'd be nice if it were propped up a little more. Um, and you always want to tell the patient what the plan is in case technology fails. So when we started the COVID screening hub, um, the patient would get dropped off all the time and then they would call back to the hub. And fortunately, it was the behavioral health 
hub number that they called back and we had no clue how to get them back on. So um, I always tell patient if for some reason this drops off, let me take your telephone number and I'll give you a call. Um, you can complete, um, if you have bad video conferencing um, experience, you can complete a consult using um, a phone if necessary. And especially during the public health emergency, um, it is also um, paid for. Um, it's really good to have high quality audio and video important. Um, we had um, some great equipment in our physical hub when we, we all had to go virtual all of a sudden in behavioral health so we could make room for the COVID screening hub. Um, and so we all went home one night and we never came back. Um, subsequent to that, some people have gone in to get um, their um, laptops um, and their um, other things. I actually ordered a, a little better monitor that makes it easier for the work. So um, if you're gonna do a lot of telehealth, um, it's really important to make your space uh, comfortable. Um, what you want to do is establish your expectations at the beginning of the appointment. So, you know, when we are pulled in on our cart, we say, we're going to um, talk with you and ask you a little bit about what's happening. Um, afterwards, we'll tell you, um, you know, what we think needs to happen from here, and then we'll contact your doctor um, and we'll discuss it, um, and your doctor will come in. So, um, if we lose you at any point in the time, just let the nurse know and she will reintroduce um, the video conferencing um, platform. Um, I always want to uh, make sure that they can hear me. Um, uh, sometimes I have trouble hearing them. They can hear me fine. Occasionally there is a delay depending on where you're at and what the broadband is like. So in one of our um, hospitals, the video is immediate and the audio lags um, a split second behind. I always, for, we have not been able to figure that out. Um, I always um, tell the patient that their audio is lagging slightly and my audio to them will lag slightly. So we just need to make sure that um, we um, hear each other before the other starts talking. So I tell them what's going on. Uh, make a, a privacy again. Um, now we are able to print out any um, educational material, safety plans, follow-up plans. Uh, we just put it in the EMR, it's printed out at their site, wherever they're at. However, if you are seeing a patient from home um, and you cannot, you know, they don't have a printer, um, I like to have them um, go ahead and get a notebook and write out all the instructions and then show me that they've written it out so that we make sure we understand each other. Um, and we talked about backup plans. So, especially in a virtual environment, we all know that good communication is the key um, for patients and doctors. But a lot of times it has to be slightly augmented when you're in the virtual environment. So um, it, we always try to tell people um, to look at the camera periodically. Um, even if the patients, if you're trying to make eye contact with the patients, the patient's eyes might be down to the bottom of the camera. So it's hard not to look at them because you want to get their reaction, uh, but do look up at the camera because that looks like direct eye contact for the patient. Um, you want to apologize if you're late. Um, you periodically want to confirm if the patient can hear you and periodically with this equipment, it will um, block out for a while. And so frequently um, we will have to say, I'm sorry, um, I did not hear you. Can you repeat that? Um, I always want to narrate the visit. Well, first I'm going to ask you about what brought you here today. And then I'll ask you some questions that may seem uh, random or odd, but we want to um, complete, we want to be complete. Um, and then after the visit's over, you know, I sort of um, tell them what I think the diagnosis is, what the next step is, whether they have any questions. Um, especially in a virtual visit, I like the teach back method to make sure that they're hearing what I'm trying to instruct and we're all communicating in the same way. The other thing is, um, 
uh, but so what we know is um, the majority of communication is not words, it is tone of voice and it is um, expressions. So it may be harder to interpret tone of voice, especially with masks um, and expressions, especially with masks. I usually ask a patient to take their mask off once they're in a private area so I actually can uh, see their expression more. Um, but um, Frequently you have to, um, because the patient has a harder time reading you virtually, is actually state what you want the patient to know. So, you know, it may not be enough to look sympathetic when they're talking about the death of their father two weeks ago. You might have to actually explain your feelings. Oh my gosh, that must have been so hard for you to lose your father. I'm so sorry. So a lot of times we verbally express uh, what we would do non-verbally in a telemedicine visit because it's um, conveyed a little bit more strongly that way. Um, if you do take notes during the session, um, like a lot of my millennials do because they're such fast typers, um, just to explain that um, I am listening, I'm taking a few notes so I make sure that I really understand what you're saying, um, but um, don't worry, I'm still listening and you want to um, look up from the note taking periodically. And then you want to finish strong. Um, you want the patient to know what you think they have, their diagnosis in English, what they should do next steps. Um, what labs they should obtain, where they should obtain them, how to get it, how to schedule the next appointment. Um, you want them to repeat that all back to you to make sure that they understand it, maybe even write it down. Um, and then I always ask them, is there anything else um, that you need from me today? Or are there any questions um, you think, or any things you think are important that I haven't covered today? And then you document the same way you would uh, in person. Um, especially with virtual, we all tend to have availability bias, okay? So what this is, is, you know, a patient brings her young uh, child in and says, uh, my child has another ear infection, okay? So how do you know? Well, he's pulling out his ear, maybe it's a nonverbal toddler or a preverbal toddler. Well, he's pulling out his ear, okay? So of course, in a non-virtual visit, the first thing you do is look in his ear and see if he has an ear infection. So especially with virtual, I think there's a little bit more availability bias if the a uh, patient comes in and says, I've got a urinary tract infection, this is what I need. It's a little more um, accessible just to agree with them without doing your due diligence. So just be aware that in virtual, there's a little bit more availability bias. Um, so how it comes out in behavioral care is we're there, we interview the patient, um, it's easy to be tempted not to get collateral information um, from others that may have additional information, but you, you can't give in to that. You have to do the same due diligence you would as um, you are doing in person. Um, it, uh, just because they're doing a virtual visit, if you cannot make a determination based on that virtual visit, you have to ask them to come in for a physical exam. Um, you, you order the same test and diagnostic tools um, as available and appropriate as you do in person. Um, and it's really important to address systemic factors. And I'll tell you how this played out with um, uh, one of um, the catches that we had. So um, we had a patient we were seeing in the emergency room and the emergency rooms move pretty quickly. They like the patients in and out um, pretty quickly because they have other patients stacking up. So we had gotten into a custom of um, really at the emergency room's request of seeing a patient even before the emergency room doctor put the note in. So um, in a situation like that, um, there was information the emergency room doctor had that was in their note um, that didn't get to us. And so that was a catch when it came to um, what to do with the patient because we did not have the full information. So we rechanged our workflow design and said, we, we won't see the patient until the emergency room has seen the patient first. Um, and you need to document your clinical decision-making just as you would in um, a, in a regular visit. Um, the other thing that we see in virtual is communication is really difficult, okay? And when we were starting in the emergency rooms, we had certain emergency rooms that only wanted us to communicate with the bedside nurse 
um, don't tell me I'm busy, um, just tell the bedside nurse. We had others that only wanted us to communicate with the provider. Um, and what we found is that you have to communicate directly with that provider. Um, there are too many um, episodes for error. And um, also in a learning environment like we have at IU Health, where we have lots of learners, learners frequently are um, intimidated or may not know additional questions to ask. And as a result, um, then you um, might not get the pushback. Maybe that um, ED doctor knows something um, and you say, I think this patient's fine to go. Um, the learner may not push back in the same way that the ED doctor might um, in saying, well, I don't know, this patient looks pretty bad to me. Can you, can you take another look? So what we have decided, um, which is not always a popular decision that we have to um, uh, actually directly communicate with the provider. Um, and we cannot communicate through the secretary um, or through uh, the bedside nurse because sometimes there is um, a little game of telephone that doesn't get um, communicated directly. If, uh, now we always use the Diagnotes platform um, for secure texting because um, we are usually on another consult by the time we're communicating um, that ED doctor is in with another patient. And so um, we communicate um, through Diagnotes. Um, anything that has to be done immediately, for an example, um, we found out a patient actually had overdosed uh, not on Boostbar, which is what the ED had said she'd um, overdosed on, but she had diagnosed on Wellbutrin, which is a much more dangerous drug to overdose on. So in that situation, we did not diagnose. We called the ED directly and made sure the bedside nurse and the provider directly knew that was the case. So um, anything urgently or that needs to be addressed urgently, uh, there just has to be a one-on-one -on -one, um, immediate conversation. Um, so there has to be a way to, um, the, and this was really difficult for us, which is why we're insisting on diagnosis. There has to be a way um, for to get additional information from referring providers or family members uh, must be available. So um, we don't make a disposition until we've done all of our uh, collaboration. And it's, uh, oops, there's a misspelling here. Um, uh, it's really helpful um, if you have the time to go to uh, team meetings or rounding meetings, because um, that really helps um, you to stay in with the, the non-virtual team um, and be able to make any catches. So um, there is just seeing what my time is. Um, Excuse, I, excuse me, I wouldn't normally interrupt you, but we're getting emergencies coming, uh, but I can finish this lecture without any problem. Um, so th there's a lot of advantages with telemedicine. Um, extending hours, creating uh, more convenient models for the patients. My um, in-person colleagues have said a lot of their patients never intend to come back to their office again, even after um, they want to continue to do telemedicine therapy appointments. Um, especially helpful for people with chronic health conditions um, that you can monitor without making them come to the office all the time. Um, you can certainly reach, uh, especially specialties can reach rural areas um, that normally don't have access to specialists. Um, and it really increases clinical workflow efficiency. So a total traditional visit time is 121 minutes versus a telemedicine visit time is 16 minutes. And you can see each of this. Um, there's the, green, the light green is the physician time. Um, the 53% uh, percent, there is the clinic wait time, um, and then there's the travel time that's 30%. Um, and so you can see how it can really cut down time of visit. Um, it's, it's both less time consuming for both the provider and the patient. Um, my outpatient um, non-virtual colleagues that are now mostly virtual say they hardly ever have no-shows. They used to have you know, maybe a no-show every, um, every day at some point. They said it really cuts down a no-show. It really cuts down on overhead costs. Um, the average emergency room visit is about $2,000. Um, and an average cost of the on-site doctor visit is $146. Um, conversely, a telehealth visit is only $79 on average. And it really cuts down on patients' um, costs. 
Um, so the Oregon um, Health and Science University said patients spend $6.4 million annually in travel costs alone. Um, and um, uh, it cuts down on that. What we did when we started our behavioral health um, we figured how much it cut down on um, travel savings. Um, so it used to be that if a patient came to the emergency room and needed a psych consult, they were placed in an ambulance and shipped to one of the three um, uh, emergency rooms in our system. So these patients would end up in um, Indianapolis, for example, that were from Paoli, Indiana, and then they had no way to get back also. So really helps patients. Um, you know, there are still definitely concerns, erosion of the um, relationship, uh, definitely threats to patient privacy. One size doesn't fit all. You can't do telemedicine visits every time um, or with every patient. Um, we just have to be careful. New doesn't necessarily mean better. We don't know um, how this is all going to turn out in the end. Um, there's still jurisdiction problems with cross-border consultations. Um, it's difficult getting informed consent. We're doing it verbally now during the public health emergency, but um, it would be hard to get written consent if you've never been in the office. There's uh, certainly lots of technology challenges. Um, and there's lots of connectivity problems. Um, uh, some of our rural emergency rooms, some of their rooms don't connect well with their Wi-Fi. Um, and we can't prioritize efficiency and economics be, before quality care. So we have to make sure that that quality care is still there. And technology is an added burden to our patients and it is an added burden to our physicians also. So I see there are a few questions and um, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Anne. Um, I can, I don't know, I can read them to you. Um, so here is one that's asking about the, um, when do you see this, the state emergency provision stopping? Uh, good, we're all waiting for that. Um, it do was you know what, what telemedicine and permissions are gonna be after it stops? No, we don't know. We do believe that um, they will be much more broad than they were before it started. Um, it has been continued, I believe, until April 1st at this point in time. It was supposed to be cut off, I think, at the end of January or sometime in February. Um, I would expect that probably will be prolonged after April. And um, I'm hoping that a new set of regulations uh, will be issued at the same time the public health emergency is uh, taken away. What about older people who have just a little bit more challenge with technology? And um, do you have any suggestions on how to help older people who, who even maybe don't have access to this type of devices or even learning how to use them? Right. Uh, so I, I do think that is a big issue. Um, you know, when we are doing older people, a lot of times with their permission, we like to have um, one of their caregivers in the room. They, they also can have hearing problems. Now, there's ways around that. You can certainly um, get um, augmented earphones that plug into um, the telemedicine carts or certainly in the computer. So there's ways around that. Um, I think the platforms are designed to be getting easier and easier for patients to use. Our platform is super easy. It's an iPad on a cart and all you do is push a button. Um, there is also some great communication, internet communication devices designed for elderly people with maybe some cognitive deficits that are designed just like that. I can't remember what they're called, but essentially they're hooked up to the family and they push a button and it, you know, it connects um, to family members. You, know, um, you don't have to sign on and do anything like that. So I think that we are looking at, um, I think the technology um, solving for people with special needs um, I think that's a great opportunity in telehealth and really help. Uh, but, um, you know, they're all one-offs at this point in time. What about liability coverage? What does that look like for telehealth? And here's the example that she gave. Um, the patient receives music therapy sessions while inpatient, and they want to follow up um, and transition services via virtual video sessions, but patient is not in the facility. So um, your liability coverage is the same um, at this point in time um, during the public health emergency. So um, 
our malpractice will cover us from telehealth um, as well as um, from virtual, uh, non-virtual visits. Um, however, it is, if it's something, uh, music therapy is probably not it, but if it is something that, you know, say you are on a telehealth call and you really decide the patient needs not to be virtual, needs to be seen, then, you know, you have to um, provide the same standard of care um, that you would um, in a non-virtual visit. Oh, what about dental? So dental use is much more restricted than medical. Any understanding if this can be resolved? Um, doing telemedicine with dental? That's, I think that's where the question went, yeah. Oh, that is really interesting. I, my, my son's a dentist. Um, I know nothing about that. I'll, <laughs> I'll ask him and get back with you, Robin. <laughs> Sounds good. I think about the, um, the liability coverage. I, as I sit with palliative care and then as I've experienced telehealth on my own, does the patient have to be in Indiana? I mean, is that, is that a requirement? That so that is very interesting. During um, the states have made a provision. Um, there is a, a compact, I think they call it, between several joining states that you can provide telehealth consultation within all these states within each other, okay? So for example, I, and Indiana is in that compact and I can't tell you what other states are. So if your patient sits in a state that is within that compact, um, you should be covered. Um, a question that came in that says, a client may report their address for the call, but maybe elsewhere for the session. Perhaps they're suicidal and the therapist or doctor needs a welfare check but they're not where you think. Is there liability to that? Um, I, I think only the liability in that you need to do your due diligence, okay? So we have had that situation in um, our peer recovery coaching. Um, a peer recovery coach had reached out to a client um, just to check and see if they had been able to get into uh, treatment. That client was suicidal. Um, the peer recovery coach was able to keep them on the line Finally, I don't know, I think through just talking through him and keeping him on the line, determined that he was in a Motel 8 someplace. Um, in the meantime, he had our um, therapist on the line tracking this. And once they figured out where he was, they were able to send the police um, for a um, wellness check. We actually brought him to the hospital and he was hospitalized. But, um, you know, you can only control what you can control. Um, but you should do your due diligence in controlling it. Are there any lessons or insights from telemedicine that might improve in-person care? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I think all the tips um, to um, conducting an um, interview um, in telemedicine should be used in in-person. They just flow maybe a little easier in person as people might be able to read your gestures um, um, and your tone of voice a little better than in telemedicine. I, I, I will say though, um, you know, we haven't really had um, much trouble in communicating well in telemedicine. For example, we have, you know, patients and they say, well, I don't think the patient's gonna talk with you because they refuse to talk with us. And they'll wheel our card in and, um, uh, you know, I like to think as behavioral health specialists, we have ways of um, helping people feel comfortable with us. And they do talk with us. I mean, they tell us um, everything we need to know. And I, I, you know, I haven't felt a lack of that connection with the patient that I thought I might. You know, I'm just as empathic, um, even though it's on a screen, um, my feelings are the same. So I, I, I think it's just, um, you have to be a little more cognizant of it. Um, but I, I haven't really seen it as much different than meeting with a person in person. All right, and I think this will be our last question. Um, if the provider is providing telemedicine from a private home space rather than their office, does that need to be documented in the patient's notes? No, the, um, what needs to be documented is their um, home uh, billing address. So our home hub is the Senate address um, and we got scattered to the winds um, in February. Um, so that is still where all of our bills go out of, you know, our headquarters, so to say. But it doesn't need to be documented that you are at home. No. Okay. 
And thank you. I knew that we would learn so much and we have. And so I just appreciate, I appreciate what you're doing for IU Health. Let me, first of all, thank you for what you're doing. Um, but then also thank you for sharing your insights and your tips for us today. Thank you. Thank you so it's much. It's been a pleasure. Bye-bye. Thanks everybody for attending.